Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rija from MSC, and welcome to today's IAS STEM Graduate Colloquium. This colloquium is jointly organized by the Graduate Student Club of School of Triple E, MSC, and SPMS. And I'm very honored to introduce our prestigious speaker, Prof. Nazaruddin, who is a professor emeritus of EPFL. Prof. Nazaruddin's research focuses on the perovskite solar cells and light emitting diodes. He has published more than 870 preview papers and 10 book chapters, and is the inventor as well as the co-inventor of over 100 patents. He has been listed as one of the top 2% most cited scientists in the world by Stanford University in October, 2022. Prof. Nadarudin is directing and managing several industrial, national, and European Union projects. He has been appointed world-class university professor by Korea University. He has also been elected to the European Academy of Science a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Telegana Academic of Science. He has won the 34th Horesmi International Award Laureate in Fundamental Science 2021. He is the Editor-in-Chief of Chemistry of Inorganic Materials and on the editorial board of several other journals. I'm very glad to welcome Professor to share his pioneer work on the topic of perovskite solar cells and the engineering method for its scale up and to enhance their stability. But before we start, please be reminded that if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box or raise your hand inside the Zoom channel, but please do not put them in the chat box. Now, let's give a warm welcome to our speaker. Professor, please. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introductions. I really appreciated all the student club uh, members and for inviting me to share some of our results. Let me share my presentation. Can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Chris for organizing this curriculum and uh, inviting me to share some of our results. So that today's my talk, uh, the title of my talk is Stable and Efficient Perovskite Solar Cells and Modules by Interface and Compositional Engineering. So you will see all the details of how we are trying to improve the stability of the perovskite solar cells by doing all these manipulations. So my name is uh, Naziruddin, and here is uh, my email address on the below. You can see the email address. Uh, if you have any queries regarding my presentation, you can send to me. I will try to answer as soon as possible. So what is perovskite actually? The perovskite material is a, a simple composition of containing ABX3. A is a, a cation. This cation can be inorganic, like a cesium or organic like methyl ammonium or formidinium. So those are the A cations as shown here in this uh, uh, perovskite structure. The A cation occupies the vacancy of the, the cavity. And the B is a metal cation, which is a lead two plus, tin two plus. But in our presentation, I will be mostly focusing on tin two plus, uh, sorry, uh, lead two plus uh, metal. And X is a halide, uh, the bromide, uh, chloride, and iodide. So these are the halides. So this material has a uh, unique properties. For example, um, when you mix um, lead iodide and methyl ammonium iodide in a one is to one ratio, you form a perovskite three dimensional structure. And this three dimensional structure has a strong light absorption in the whole visible region as shown in this absorption spectral spectra of the material. So this is the absorption spectra of the uh, perovskite, three-dimensional perovskite material, which absorbs all the uh, light within the visible region from 400 nanometers to 820 nanometers. The second interesting property of this material is a tunable band gap. So you can see, uh, you can change the absorption properties of these materials by changing um, the halide composition. So if you look at the, uh, uh, in this uh, diagram, where uh, this is taken from this, uh, the reference in the, in the below. So perovskite absorbs up to uh, 820 nanometers. As you increase the bromide 
uh, percentage in the perovskite composition, you can see the, the widening of the band gap. So the absorption moves to from 820 nanometers to uh, 550 nanometers. So this way, you have uh, plenty of opportunities to tune the material properties. The third important property of this material is a small excitation dissociation energy. So what do you, what does it mean? So when you shine the perovskite absorb material, you create positive and negative charges. They are separated instantaneously. So this this dissociation is uh, typically less than thirty milli electron volts. So this is these are the very interesting properties of this particular material. So how do you deposit this material uh, to make the solar cells? So in the literature, there are uh, several methods. So I highlight, I'm highlighting uh, three particular methods. The one, the fourth one, which is uh, two-step solution and sublimation, this can be useful for the industrialization of the perovskite solar cell technology. So let's start one-step solution method. In this method, what we do, we have a methyl ammonium, that's an organic cation, lead iodide, um, in a particular solvent like a DMF or DMF DMSO mixture of solvents, so you dissolve in this composition in these uh, solvents and then uh, spin coat it and annihilate. You found the perovskite films. In a two-step process, what we do first we deposit lead iodide and followed by methyl ammonium iodide and annealing. So this gives you the perovskite films. The third technique is the sublimation where you have a different chamber, different uh, crucibles, lead iodide, inorganic, or uh, formidinium and cesium bromide. You can have it uh, four or six crucibles depending on the, your the operator. So in this way, you can manipulate the perovskite composition um, in a gas phase uh, and on the substrate, it deposits and it forms a, a very nice perovskite crystals. So however, the other, other technique is a two-step method where with slot decoding because large these are the techniques which are for the small devices for large scale applications um slot decoding is the very important technique where you first deposit lead iodide by slot decoding and then followed by you expose to methyl ammonium iodide or uh, formidinium iodide organic cation to form the perovskites so this uh, two-step solution followed by sublimation technique seems to be more suitable for the industrial applications. So that's it, preparation of the perovskite films. So now you have a, once if you have a perovskite film, now you can form a, a two types of uh, solar cells. One is called PIN, where the perovskite is encapsulated between the hole transporting layer and electron transport layer. The light is coming through the hole transporting layer. So therefore, here the whole transporting material has to be colorless. In the other configuration, which is NIP, so the electron transport layer is deposited, typically TaO2, tin oxide. And in this way, you can, uh, these materials, oxide materials are colorless. So you have a, a transmission of all the light absorbing, absorbed by the perovskite layer. So followed by you have a HDL in the NIP configuration, in the PIN configuration, you have a ETL layer. So these are the two dominant configurations which are available. So here I highlight most of the studies in the literature, they are using a triple cation perovskite, that's a cesium, a small percentage, formidinium, and majority of the cation is a formidinium followed by a small amount of methyl ammonium. So there are logic for using these three cations in order to enhance the stability and uh, increase the phase stability of the FA, uh, for alpha phase of the FA uh, PBA3. Um, in addition, uh, there are ion migrations, there are defects in order to in, uh, decrease these defects and prevent the ion migration. We also use ionic uh, liquids as an additive. In all these cases, in most 5% uh, five, five excess of lead will be used. So this 5% excess is there is a purpose of using this 5% excess lead iodide where this excess lead iodide you convert into two-dimensional perovskite that we will see as we go into interface modifications. So this is the composition of the perovskite. And now if you have this uh, um, ETL layer and absorber layer and pero uh, the whole transporting material, when you shine the light, the perovskite um, gets excited, the positive charges are in the valence band and the electrons are in the conduction band 
and the conduction band is well aligned with the electron transport layer. So electrons are injected into PTL layer and the positive charges are extracted into whole transporting material. So here is the, uh, the cross-sectional image of our solar cell, our perovskite solar cell, where we are having a conducting glass, a compact layer of TaO2, followed by a mixed layer of TaO2 and tin oxide. You will see uh, the purpose of this having a double oxide layers in the charge transport layers. So here in this particular case, consider we are having a double oxide layers, TaO2 followed by tin oxide and 600 nanometers uh, thickness of perovskite layer followed by a very thin layer of a two dimensional perovskite based on the phenyl ammonium iodide. And then we have a, a spiromatide as a full transport material contact. So this particular configuration here is shown again. Um, uh, it gives uh, in our lab 25.54% efficiency. This is certified at uh, uh, Fujian Metrology Institute. So this is the highest efficiency in the lab, but how does it compare with the literature? So, so in the literature, the people have already certified 26.1% efficiency. So there is a huge prospects for the perovskite solar cells to increase the efficiency uh, even beyond 26. In our lab, we have obtained 25.54% efficiency. Now, so the other configuration is the PIN. Um, just for the sake of discussion, so I have included uh, two examples for the PIN configuration. Um, you have a conducting glass, and then we deposit whole transport material. In this case, I have taken an example of PTA, but many groups now are, they are using nickel oxide as a whole transporting material. Then you deposit perovskite, and then we have a, a very thin layer of passivation layer, uh, ferrocene, um, thiophene containing ferrocene molecules, which they act as a passivation layer followed by C60, that's the electron transport layer. And then you have a, a BCP, this is a passivation layer, um, which, uh, which prevents the silver uh, migration or formation of the silver complex using BCP. So this uh, passivation buffer layer is important in order to get the highest efficiency. So using this type of configuration, PIN, this is not my work, this is, I have taken this work from Imperial and City University. So they have reported 24.5% efficiency using a PIN configuration. Now this is our work where we have replaced the PTA as the whole transport material by a four pack or two pack. So the, here is the, uh, uh, the self-assembled monolayer. So this uh, topic is becoming very popular and also very attractive. Uh, what you do is a, you have a, a, a whole transporting group, head group and anchoring group. So what you do is you mix this uh, um, four pack or two pack of whole transporting material self-assembled monolayer in the perovskite solution when you deposit on top of uh, ITO, so this uh, self-assembled monolayers, they attract to the ITO and they form a, form a monolayer of the whole transporting material. Then this monolayer um, builds the perovskite crystal growth on top of it, and followed by we have a, a C60 and BCP and silver as a, a contact layers. So using this type of configuration, here the attractiveness is that we combine the the self assembled monolayer into the perovskite solution, um, it means that there is an excess of uh, whole transport material inside the perovskite composition besides it's forming a, a self assembled monolayer on the bottom. So this uh, configuration also gives 24.5% efficiency. Uh, this work appeared in Nature Energy 2023. Now I just give the highlight of the, the tandem configuration. So since we have a perovskites which are very efficient, um, the people have started turning their attention towards uh, making high efficiency with the same geometric surface area. So you take the silicon substrate and then you deposit uh, perovskite on top of it, it becomes a tandem. And the tandem efficiency, the cost group has reported uh, over 33.2% efficiency. This is a very high efficiency. So in a tandem configuration, there are two types of tandems you can think of. So this is a very interesting research project. Uh, do we have to have a, a four terminal or two terminal? Which one is the best one? Uh, for example, if you go into the details of the perovskite composition, segregation is the one of the biggest problem. So if you want to have a two terminal configuration, the perovskite composition has to be, the band gap has to be 1.7 
the 1.7 band gap has to optimize with the bromide and iodide composition. Eventually, the halides, they segregate, and if they segregated halides, they have a disadvantage in the two terminal configuration. So to avoid this segregation and the disadvantage of this, uh, the voltage losses, the four terminal configuration is more interesting. So these are very interesting uh, research topics. Uh, within the P, uh, within the tandem configuration, you can also have a NIP perovskite on top of the silicon or PAN configuration. We will discuss all these details in the tandem configuration. So here, uh, the highest efficiency is the important thing, 33.2% efficiency. Now, despite the highest efficiency of NIP, that's a 26.1 certified, and PAN 25.4, and silicon perovskite tandem solar cells 33.2, stability is the main problem for commercialization. So now the question is, how can we increase the stability of this perovskite absorber by, by changing a different composition? So here is the, uh, the my talk starts, the compositional engineering of perovskite layer in order to increase the stability of the perovskite absorber layer. And the interface engineering also is important. There are a lot of defects. So if we can um, uh, perceive this defect, you can increase the power conversion efficiency and as well as stability. So you will see a couple of uh, slides based on the interface engineering. Charge transport materials. So we have a two types of charge transport materials, electron transport material, pole transport materials. The band alignment and stability interface of this charge transport materials is important. So we have developed a couple of uh, uh, whole transport materials series and electron transport materials you will see uh, on the charge transport materials. Um, I, I take uh, examples from literature, silicon perovskite, tandem solar cells to show the highest efficiency. And at the end, if time permits, if we can also discuss the cost analysis. What would, what would be the cost of the perovskite solar cells if you start building 100 megawatts plant? So let's take the composition engineering of perovskite uh, material. So the basic formula is the ABX3, A is a cation. So the cations, there are three types of cations here I have taken, methyl ammonium, formidinium, and guanidinium. As you can see from these three cations, one has a one amino group, two amino group, three amino groups. So these amino groups, they have a, a, uh, the hydrogen bonds with the iodide group. So the number of amino groups in enhances the stability of this composition. That's one of the logic. But if you look at the size of this uh, guanidinium, which is a slightly um, at the edge of the uh, 3D perovskite formation. So what happens if we have a pure guanidinium, it will not form a three-dimensional perovskite, it will form a low-dimensional perovskite. So what we have done is, can we combine this larger guanidinium cation, the smaller methyl ammonium cation in a particular ratio, for example, 75% methyl ammonium iodide, and 25% guanidinium. So these are the uh, simulations of based on the DFT calculations. If you can see the guanidinium is inserted in the cubic cell where the guanidinium, is, guanidinium cation is interacting with iodides. So therefore, this particular unit cell is stabilized because of enhanced hydrogen bonding. That's a take home message. Now, how does the efficiency uh, reports? So the efficiency is at that time, it was around 20%. But however, if you look at the stability, the black line, the stability curve is shown here. The black line, 1000 hours uh, stability under uh, light and heat conditions, it decreasing significantly compared to with the 25% of, of guanidinium containing the cation. So the guanidinium containing cation shows significant enhanced stability. So this is the cation modification enhanced stability of the perovskite solar cells. So if you look at the organic cations, they have a issues with the methyl ammonium uh, sublimation problem is uh, the dissociation is the biggest problem. For medinium, you have a alpha and delta phase uh, transformation. And also for the tandem configuration, the optimum band gap of the perovskite should be around 1.7 EV. So 1.7 EV you can obtain by changing the organic cations by a cesium cation. So here is the cesium cation containing perovskite. However, the problem with the cesium perovskite, cesium lead iodide perovskite, is the stability of the alpha phase, black phase, which also undergoes into a delta phase, yellow phase. 
Uh, but here the question is, how can we use stabilize the alpha phase of the cesium lead iodide perovskite? So we have come up with a, a modified ionic liquid. Uh, the structure is shown below, the crystal structure of the ionic liquid. And the name of the ionic liquid is triphenyl phosphine ammonium, uh, bis-trifluoromethane sulfonylamide. This is a ionic liquid. By combining this ionic liquid in presence of cesium lead iodide perovskite, you can stabilize as a alpha phase. This work is appeared in um, beginning of this year, science advances. So if you look at this cesium uh, PBI3 has a 1.7 band gap EV and the VOC is 1.21 and the resulting power conversion efficiency is at 20.64% efficiency. So this is a smaller cell area. And here is the, uh, for the uh, certified efficiency uh, of the same cell which is close to 19.7% efficiency. And we made a mini modules using a same configuration, same material, and the efficiency are around 17% in the lab, as certified at 16.1% uh, efficiency. Now, so there is a, I have taken another as a, a representative example, how to increase the stability of the perovskite composition. So as, as we discussing, the perovskites are very interesting material, but it has a ion migration is one of the biggest problem and the ion migration creates a defects. How can we prevent this ion migration? So what we have done is we have incorporated ionic liquid, which has a lot of ions. This is point number one. When we are incorporating ionic liquid, so what we have done is we functionalize the ionic liquid. And if you look at the ionic liquid here, this has a double bond, which can be polymerized group. And then we have substituted the hydrophobic unit here with fluorine substitutions. So the name of the ionic liquid is, is given here. You can see the ionic liquid name is tridecafluorooctyl imidazolium iodide. So this is ionic liquid. By combining this ionic liquid in the perovskite composition, so now if you can see, I just highlight one peak, that's a um, XRD peak at uh, uh, 12.6. So this is a byproduct by of lead iodide, the decomposition of the perovskite. So now if you look at the, um, in the absence of this ionic liquid, you can see the formation of lead iodide peak clearly as you, you add this ionic liquid into the perovskite composition, 1%, it's decreasing the formation of lead iodide. I mean, the 2%, it further decreases 4% of ionic liquid. So there is no formation of the lead iodide, showing that this ionic liquid is stabilizing the, uh, the perovskite composition. Here is the, just to show demonstration, um, this is the reference sample without any ionic liquid. And on the right side, we see the, uh, perovskite films with ionic liquid. They were kept uh, two months outside ambient air, 50% humidity. This is the front side, uh, back side. So without ionic liquid, there the color has disappeared because it's uh, dissociating into its uh, constituent components. Whereas in presence of ionic liquid, even at two outside conditions, the film is uh, extremely stable with even 1% of ionic liquid doping. So now the question is, uh, the efficiency is 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 uh, is reasonably high at that time, around twenty percent, uh, depending on the ratio of the ionic liquid. So the best one is one percent. Now, but what is this ionic liquid doing? So we we took the XP, X, um, XPS analysis of this uh, ionic liquid uh, containing a one percent containing ionic liquid, um, the fluorine binding energy. This is a fluorine binding energy. With the zero percentage, you see there is no fluorine, uh, the group, and with one percent, uh, this is a fluorine binding energy, and with four percent, this is just to guide. Now we have taken our perovskite composition, and then we, with the focus line beam, we etched from the top to bottom. So at zero nanometers, you can see at the fluorine binding energy at six hundred eighty eight eV, and if you go up to twenty five nanometers, and fo uh, focus line beam. Uh, digging into the perovskite grain, you can see still the presence of uh, fluorine binding energy. After 50 nanometers, there is nothing. So that means this ionic liquid is a forming a shell on the top of perovskite grains. Why should it form a shell on top of perovskite grain? It's because of this octyl group, which has a 
a fluorinated group and these fluorinated groups they form they float the molecule and then when the crystallization forms the this ionic liquid is forming a shell on top of the grain so this way you can increase the stability of the perovskite composition even at 60 degrees temperature if you see it's a reference sample the formation of lead iodide is a significantly dominated in presence of a 1% ionic liquid 720 hours of heating at 60 degrees, you can see in the absence of the formation of lead iodide peak. So this way you can increase the stability of the uh, perovskite composition. But uh, as I mentioned, this hydrophobicity, um, we can measure the, the contact angle measurement. So this is the reference sample, which has a 75 degrees, the, re the, the, uh, the contact angle. When, when we add 1%, the contact angle increases to 87. If we increase the ionic liquid content to 2%, it goes to 98, the contact angle degrees. And if it's a 4%, you can see the contact angle is increasing significantly. So the purpose here is the ionic liquid is protecting the perovskite by hydrophobicity of its nature. So I have taken another example um, for, uh, for stabilizing the ionic uh, perovskite composition. So here is the ionic liquid with the functional groups. What are the functional groups? Cyanide, um, cyanide with the long alkyl chain, the cyanide groups with the two times, uh, two, two times substituted. So the purpose here is the cyanide groups should interact with the lead two plus. So this way you form a, a nucleus when you have a ionic liquid, in the composition of the perovskite solution, lead iodide, organic uh, cation, and uh, this ionic liquid. So it forms a nucleation, and the nucleation should grow into crystals. So that's the purpose of having this functionalized ionic liquids. So by measuring uh, with the photovoltaic properties, you can see uh, with the long alkyl chain, this is a propyl cyanide group, which gives the efficiency close to 23%, and the remaining ones are uh, lower and the control at the same time it is close to 21% efficiency. However, if you look at the stability data with this ionic liquid as additive in the perovskite solution, um, up to 1000 hours stability measurements, uh, you can see a significant enhanced compared to the reference sample that's a black line. So now this is the computational engineering of the perovskite to increase the stability, um, to decrease the ion migration with using different uh, ionic liquids. Now we go to the interface engineering. There are two interfaces. One is a, a perovskite whole transporting material interface, the perovskite ETL interface. So let's take the, the top interface that between the perovskite and whole transporting material. So if you look at the um, perovskite composition, ABX3, it's a three-dimensional perovskite. And when we have a A cation, which size is sufficiently uh, good enough, that forms a three-dimensional structure. What happens if the cation size is bigger than the cavity, then it slices this uh, dimensionality into lower dimensionality. And this gives you opportunity to have a, the controlled growth of a three-dimensional versus the lower dimensional perovskite compositions. So here I have taken a couple of examples of the larger cations, but we will not discuss all these larger cations, just we take the phenylethylamine one cation. And this cation, when you form a lead iodide, it forms a two-dimensional perovskite. And the two-dimensional perovskite shows a very nice absorption, but it absorbs only up to 500 nanometers. On the contrary, three-dimensional perovskite absorbs the whole visible region up to 450 nanometers. But the beauty here is the two-dimensional perovskite are extremely stable compared to the three-dimensional perovskite. Can we combine the two-dimensional perovskite, which are extremely stable, uh, with the three-dimensional perovskite, which absorbs all the visible light, but less stable? By optimizing these two together, then we can have a, a both stability and high efficiency of the perovskite solar cells. So here I have taken two examples, fluorophenylethylamine, one cation, and the second cation example I have taken is a pentafluorobenzylamine. You must have recognized we are using the fluoride groups in order to create the hydrophobicity because the hydro, hydro, hydrophilicity of the perovskite is the biggest problem. So by having this type of hydrophobic cations, it can prevent the humidity induced degradation. That's one of the main reason having the fluorine substitutions. Now, 
by making these two cations, you can form a two-dimensional perovskite. And the two-dimensional perovskite absorption spectra is shown here. This is a fluorophenylethylamine absorption spectra of the two-dimensional perovskite. This is pentafluorobenzylamine cation containing two-dimensional perovskite. Now, when we deposit this two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite, you can see the black line is the reference sample, pure three-dimensional perovskite. And the blue is the uh, fluorophenylethylamine two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite. And the red curve is uh, pentafluoro uh, two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite. So what does it give you? So here is the comparison between the photovoltaic data versus stability. So the reference sample has a 20% efficiency with 1.09 volts. Now, by putting the fluorophenylethylamine on top of three-dimensional perovskite, the power conversion efficiency increased from 20 to 21%, and the VOC from 1.09 to 1.13, that's a blue line. Now, by putting the two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite containing pentafluorobenzylamine, now you can see the power conversion efficiency from reference sample 20, it went up to 21.65. The VOC increased from 1.09 to 1.15, that's a red line. And the efficiency increase is significant, but however, the more significant data is the stability. And the, the black line is a reference sample. The stability is decreasing uh, up to uh, 1,000 hours, more than 30% decrease in the in the in the in the stability uh, compared to uh, the pentafluorobenzylamine containing two decations it remains intact up to 1000 hours so this is the beauty of having the interface engineering of the perovskite composition by two dimensional perovskites so this is our recent work what what we have done is the to see the influence of the position of the fluoride substitution so here is the one example that's a orthofluoro substituted phenylamine and meta and para. And similarly, instead of fluoro, we can also have a three other cations, that's a chloride and bromide. So in total, we have studied nine cations with three different salts, like a fluoride, chloride, and bromide in three different positions, ortho, meta, and para. Now look at the efficiency data of this uh, reference sample without any two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite. So the efficiency is around 20%. Now, if we put the ortho fluoro substituted, that's a, uh, the, uh, the left uh, corner uh, top cation, and you can see the efficiency increased from 20 to 22.31% efficiency. And if you take the meta cation, which is uh, the meta fluoro substituted phenylethylamine, and efficiency increased to 23%. And similarly, um, the para one is again uh, lower, that's a 22%. But if you compare fluoride versus fluoride, the chloride is almost same or slightly enhanced when compared to the fluoride. And the bromide also is similar to the chloride, or slightly improved. So in all these cases, ortho para meta the meta-substituted halide compounds like either fluoro or chloro or bromo, the meta-substituted ones gives you highest efficiency, 23.42% efficiency. So why this is happening actually? So at this stage, uh, we took the help of DFT, uh, uh, DFT calculations expert Olga from Russia, and she came up with the explanation that the formation energies um, uh, the lower formation energies of this meta-substituted cation and then the higher interfacial dipole um, achieved by this uh, meta-substituted cations is the reason for high efficiency. This is the theoretical interpretation of the reason by why the meta-substituted cations is enhancing the efficiency. Uh, the more details you will find, this will be online this week. Now, I, I have taken another two examples, um, the tuning isomers, so here is the, again, the para-substituted thalamines, the meta-substituted ones, ortho-substituted ones. Now, based on the geometry, the steric influence, you can see the only, the para-substituted one, this one, para-substituted one, forms a two-dimensional perovskite. On the contrary, meta and ortho, they don't form a two-dimensional perovskite. Still, we deposited these organic cations on top of perovskite, three-dimensional perovskite, now, if you look at the power conversion efficiency, 
So this is uh, the control. The best efficiency is 22% efficiency. Now, if you substitute with the para on top of uh, three-dimensional perovskite, the efficiency is lower than the control. Now, if you took the meta-substituted one, the efficiency even significantly lower, 16% efficiency. Oh, the best one is 19%. But uh, however, ortho substituted one, you see 24% efficiency. So this you can imagine by steric reasons that the ortho has a accumulation effect. This is the ortho substitutable. It has a steric effect and as well as coordinating ability to the uh, lead, uh, the vacancies of the lead two plus. So that's the reason why this gives you highest efficiency with the ortho substituted one, 24% uh, efficiency. Now we go uh, towards the charge transport materials. So there are two types of charge transport, electron transport materials and hole transport materials. Now let's see the electron transport materials. Here is the, the electron transport materials. I have taken uh, three examples, TaO2 as electron transport material, tin oxide, which is also a very nice electron transport material, and the combination of TaO2 and tin oxide. Now, if you look at the, the efficiency and the stability data of this uh, metal oxide ETL layer, uh, pure TiO2, um, the efficiency is decreasing significantly uh, up to 1000 uh, 1, hours. On the contrary, uh, tin oxide, pure tin oxide, um, that's a red curve, which is merged with uh, the blue dots. The blue dots are TiO2 followed by tin oxide. So what is happening here is, that when we have a pure TiO2 as the electron transport layers, when you deposit perovskite on top of ETL, and then the, when the light is passing through the TiO2, so this is TiO2 is a photoactive material, and it's a forming a holes between this interface. So the delamination followed by the formation of the holes followed by delamination is the main problem that is uh, decreasing the efficiency. However, if we passivate the TiO2 or just replace TiO2 by pure tin oxide, you can see the intact efficiency uh, because of the reduced activity of the interface between the perovskite and ETL layer. So the delamination has reduced significantly. This is one example I have taken. Now, the second example I have taken is uh, a combining the UV filtering uh, compound. This is a typically we have taken the sunscreen material we incorporated into the ETL layer, that's a tin oxide. So this is a reference sample. The power conversion efficiency is 20.78. Now by incorporating a sunscreen material inside the, inside the ETL layer, you can see the increase of the efficiency to 22.54% efficiency. So here what is happening is incorporation of the ET, this uh, sunscreen material in the ETL layer, has, this material has a Quino and other groups. And these groups, they, they interact with the perovskite, the forming the better interface between the ETL and then the perovskite. So this is a very interesting uh, observation uh, coming from our group. That's the improvement of the, the interface between the ETL and the perovskite composition. Um, so I have taken this, uh, the last example on the ETL layer. So TiO2, we have a nanoparticles. And we developed TaO2 single crystalline materials. So the band energy the alignment is shown on the left side. Um, there is a small difference in the, the LUMO level, the, the conduction band of the nanoparticles versus a single crystalline TaO2 material. So you have a perovskite. The perovskite uh, injects electron into the a conduction band of this single crystalline material. So there is a slight increase here. But the beauty of this single crystalline uh, TiO2 nanoparticles is, you can see here uh, the PV data, the current is almost the same. We will see a slightly increased. The fill factor has increased significantly. It's because of the enhanced conductivity of this single crystalline TiO2 nanoparticles compared to nanoparticles. So this is uh, this data you can also measure, get the from microconductivity measurements uh, done by Professor Vladimir um, in Germany. So he helped us to understand these materials, um, the conductivity properties. So this is the highest efficiency which we have reported, 24.5, using this new uh, type of uh, TO2 uh, single crystalline materials. So we increase the um, the size of the cell. This is a very small cell. 
and then we increase to 24.63 centimeters square and the efficiency is 22.87. So we have a nine subsets. Uh, they are series in interconnected, series in inter interconnected, and that gives you 10.15 uh, volts. So the voltage is quite high and the power conversion efficiency is 22.87. This is one of the highest efficiency uh, coming for the mini module size of uh, close to 25 uh, square centimeters. The whole transporting material is another interesting category of materials, which are stability of this material is very important. In PIN configuration, people are using uh, nickel oxide as a whole transporting material or PTA as a whole transporting material. In the, in the NIP configuration, the whole transporting material, the majority of the groups are working with the spirometide. The spirometide is a non-conducting material, which has to be doped with the um, lithium TFSI, tertiary butyl pyridine, and cobalt complexes in order to oxidize. So all these dopants enhances uh, the, uh, the stability, uh, the destabilizer, destabilizes the whole transporting material by uh, by coordinating this uh, oxidized whole transporting material with the tertiary butyl pyridine. So this is the main drawback of the whole transport material in an IP configuration. So can we increase the stability of this whole transport material by increasing the, the conjugation so that you can, you can move the positive charges in the whole unit? So we increase the, uh, the, the pi conjugation of the whole transport material so that the positive charge created can migrate all over the HTM and therefore increase the stability. This was the, the basic logic of the uh, designing this new whole transporting material. Look at the efficiency data. So this is a spiro based one, 24.34% efficiency. With the new whole transporting material, we got a slightly increased efficiency. It's because of the, uh, and stabilized the HOMO level and the stable whole transporting material, 25.25% efficiency with this new whole transporting material. The mini module of uh, 27.56 centimeters square, we got 21.86% uh, efficiency, which is, uh, which is certified again uh, in, in China, FIL, uh, that's a 21.78% efficiency using this type of new whole transporting material. Angle. So you can see more details in the Angle and the Shemi uh, International Edition. So similarly, uh, we could we kept the spiro group intact, but now we have changed the uh, substitution uh, from methoxy to carboxy. Uh, the, that's a carb uh, sorry carbozol methoxy carbozol groups. Now methoxy carbozol group containing HTL name is BSA fifty. Now if you look at the efficiency is twenty two point six five. How does it with compare with the spirometer 23.37? This is very close, but still lower than the spirometer as a reference sample. Instead of a, a carbozole, methoxy carbozole, if we put the methoxy amines, and then the efficiency decreased to 21.26. So the take home message is methoxy carbozoles are more suitable as a whole transporting material. So therefore what we have done is, um, we here we have incorporated the methoxy carbozone, but we made a flexibility within the whole transporting material. The purpose here is, so we have a defect. Imagine we have a defect on the perovskite surface. By having this flexibility on top of uh, the whole transporting material on top of perovskite, it can perceive That was the idea. So here we have changed the chain length of the uh, two carbozole containing units from C1, which gives you uh, reference sample always uh, very high efficiency, 23.34. That's a spirometer as a reference sample for us. The C1, the link between these two carbozole units is 21% efficiency. If we increase the carbon length from C1 to C3, the efficiency increases to 22.27. From C3 to C6, the efficiency increases to 23.22. So this is a very interesting flexible whole transporting material in order to stabilize the perovskite on top of the, in order to perceive the defects on the perovskite. So this type of HTMs, so you can see more details in advanced materials, which is also online. Now you have seen the electron transport materials, whole transport materials, but if you look at in the literature, 
The most stable configuration is, is called a triple layer, where we have a TaO2 followed by zirconium oxide and carbon as a, a contact. So you make this triple layer cell, inject, inkjet print the uh, perovskite composition into the perovskite, and this way, these uh, cells, they have a efficiencies in the range of 12% on a smaller scale area. Um, but if you take the, the large area of this size, 10 by 10, the efficiency was close to 10%. However, if you look at the stability, this is the highest stable performing perovskite composition in triple layer configuration, which gives 12,000 hours stability under outdoor conditions. So this is a very extremely stable performing uh, perovskite uh, configuration. However, the efficiencies are lower. Since we have the knowledge of this uh, um, reducing the interface combinations by two-dimensional perovskites, can we combine our previous knowledge of the two-dimensional perovskites with the triple layer configuration? That was the study. So there is no whole transport material here. Um, the whole transport material is, so you can consider the two-dimensional perovskite acts as a, a whole transport material followed by the carbon. So this particular the triple layer configuration uh, gives us efficiency of 18% with the two-dimensional perovskite without two-dimensional perovskite in the range of 15%. And the stability with the two-dimensional perovskite on top of whole transport material free devices is quite significantly enhanced compared to without two-dimensional perovskites. So these are the whole transport material free configurations. I come towards the, uh, the perovskite tandem solar cells. So as I mentioned before, so is it a two terminal configuration is better than the four terminal or four terminal is better than the two terminal? It all depends on how you look at it. So in my point of view, this is very interesting research topic. Can we go uh, the tandem at a wafer level or can we go for the tandem at a module level? So this is also very interesting research topic uh, for students. And then also, can we deposit a PAN configuration or NIP on top of silicon wafers, for example. So let me take the two, term, uh, two terminal configuration as shown here, the two terminal configuration. Bottom is a silicon solar cell and the top is a perovskite layer. And so in between we have a interconnection layer. So after the interconnecting layer, so if we put the electron transport layer followed by the perovskite and whole transporting material, then this is a NIP configuration on top of silicon solar cell. Similarly, we can also change this interconnecting layer followed by the whole transporting material. This whole transporting material is very popular here. The many groups are using SAMS, self-assembled monolayer, which I showed you a two pack and four pack. So these are the carbozole containing phosphonic acid groups, which absorb self-assembles on top of this uh, layer, ETL, uh, the HTL layer on the recombination layer, uh, followed by the perovskite, and the ETL layer is a C60, and then we have a contact. So these are the uh, very interesting topics. The, the drawback of the, the two terminal configuration is, we as I mentioned before, the composition has to be mixed bromide and iodide. The different uh, halides certainly will have a segregation problem. Even the cations also, they segregate. So the cations has to be a, a cesium, which is extremely stable and pure iodide, this can be very interesting composition for the two, uh, two terminal configuration. In order to avoid these complications of the segregation, the one approach will be the four terminal, but the four terminal, you have to have a two extra layers of the electrodes, which is a extra cost. So using this um, configuration, silicon, and then the deposition of a conform, uh, conformal coating of the perovskite, this is work which I have taken from EPFL Bolivs group. Um, so they have deposited the perovskite confocally on top, conformally on top of the pyramids of the silicon uh, pyramids. And they managed to get uh, the current matching of around 20.6 and 20.6. Uh, with efficiency reaching 31.25% efficiency using the silicon perovskite tandem configuration. And this work is uh, certified by at, at NREL and the efficiency certified was 31.25. It's, it's a similar as they measured in the lab. Now, here are the a very recent work uh, coming from the cost group. So they have used two pack and uh, the two pack is a, a carbozole with the uh, 
to methyl, uh, the ethyl groups and the phosphonic group. The phosphonic group goes to the, the recombination layer. It forms a self assembled monolayer. And followed by, if you look at the, the number of layers they have optimized. So all this optimization is the band alignment and the reducing the recombination. You, by just optimizing all these thin layers, particularly the thickness of the uh, electron transport layer, uh, thickness of the um, uh, IZO. So these are the very important parameters which they have optimized and optimized the perovskite efficiencies, they have reached over 33%, 33.2% certified again at jet level, 32.5% efficiency. Now, if you look at the performance of individual cells, so if you look at the silicon solar cell, the VOC is 708 milli electron volts. This is a, the bottom cell data. Now, if you look at the, the blue line, this is a, the perovskite solar cell efficiency, which, is a, which has a 1.28 volts. And if you look at measure the uh, the peros silicon and perovskite open cell potential 1.95, which is a, a just additive of the perovskite and then the silicon solar cell. So this is a beautiful configuration uh, to get highest uh, VOC possible using this type of self assembled monolayers. So the highest efficiency, um, to my knowledge, is based on this optimization of the thicknesses of the various layers. Now. What is the prospects? Because we have a silicon solar cells, which gives you 20%. Now, if we go for a tandem, same geometrical area, we can increase the power conversion efficiency by 40%. This is a, a huge advantage. And in addition, we can also think of using, this is the, the picture I have taken from the recent science publication, 35 terawatts. How can we um, we reach 35 terawatts without, without sacrificing a lot of land. So this is the concept which I thought of showing here, uh, where we can combine the agriculture as well as the photovoltaic, agri-photovoltaics, instead of having pure silicon solar cells, if you turn down, you increase the efficiency and you can also have a, the cultivation on the, on the ground floor. So the perovskite mini modules in our group so we measure, made this, uh, several of these mini modules, including flexible ones. The 22.4% is the highest efficiency in our group in this surface area of 45 centimeters square, uh, which entered into um, Martin Green's uh, special issue of high efficiency of the mini modules uh, of 24.4% uh, efficiency, sorry, 22.4% efficiency. Uh, so how does the competition with the perovskite solar cells? Panasonic is working on 30 by 30 modules and they reported close to 18% efficiency. Atmolite, uh, very recently, they reported 20% efficiency. And now Atmolite and uh, um, Microconta and GCL, that's the Chinese companies, they are working towards the one by two meter square perovskite modules, larger modules. And our cells, as I mentioned, it's a still a smaller cell. Uh, that money mini module 22.4 percent this is the competition the main competition is coming from china atmolite gcl and microconta so this is a slide i borrowed from microconta uh, So that's the Atmolite progress. Um, now I show you the, the uh, utility for the uh, for the various building applications, building integrated photovoltaics and utility scale applications. Now, if very quickly, last two minutes, I just want to show the cost analysis. What happens if you decided to start working on the 100 megawatts per oscite solar panel manufacturing process? So we did the various uh, options. We have taken the TO2 as electron transport material. That's a compact layer followed by uh, mesoporous TO2 layer, perovskite composition, spiral, and contact can be a 3D metals, chromium, and copper. And the materials cost using this type of configuration based on the catalog chemicals, it's around $6 if we go 100 megawatt scale. If we start gigawatt scale, this will be around $5 per square meter. That's a pure material cost. 
Now, of course, there are two glass plates, which will be around $12. So these are the, the typical cost of the one square meter uh, perovskite panels. Now, if you take the option two, where we are having, again, a compact layer of TO2 followed by misoporous TO2, perovskite, spiro, and silver as a ink, the cost is around close to $7 per meter square material. And if you take the option three, where we are replacing TO2 by tin oxide, perovskite, spiro, and chromium, so this is the lowest material cost, which is around $3 per square meter at 100 megawatt scale. And there's the fourth option, again, with the silver ink. This is slightly higher. So this is the cheapest one. The carbon configuration, which also I discussed, but it has a highest uh, cost uh, tag is because the carbon paste thickness is a few micrometers thick. So that's the reason why the cost of this material has gone up significantly. So the minimum sustainable price, if you start your company with 100 megawatt scale, what would be the minimum sustainable price? So that's a 30 cents per watt. And we have simulated in different countries, um, the Switzerland, Poland, Spain, Egypt, depending on the, uh, the sun intensity. So let's take the average so we can consider 30 cents uh, watt peak. That's a, the cost for the minimum sustainable price. Now, if you look at the leveraged cost of electricity, uh, which can be, uh, suppose, uh, if the degradation rate is, this is the degradation rate percentage of the perovskite, so it can be around uh, 3 cents per kilowatt hour. This is based on the Monte Carlo simulations. And now, if you see the, uh, the leveraged cost of electricity with, for, with respect to the increased power consumption efficiency. So today, we are at 20% level, the module level. Uh, and if we go up to 25% module level efficiency, it can be even 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour. The energy payback time also we simulated. This is uh, the left side is the energy payback time, just the module energy payback time. And the right side is the energy payback time with the including installation costs. The perovskite solar cells has a typically very low energy payback time, less than one year. Uh, for the just a standalone technology, but with the installation costs, it will be around 18 months. Um, this one, I, I, I would like to just conclude my presentation. So the ionic liquids are important to stabilize the perovskite composition. Uh, the 3D, 2D interface uh, engineering is important to increase the stability, enhance the hydrophobicity, and increase the stability of the perovskite uh, layers. Um, single crystalline TO2 nanoparticles uh, for narrowing the stability gap towards the stable and efficient perovskite modules, which I showed you the data. The perovskite module shows high efficiency, 22.4. This is our lab. This is still highest um, the record for the 27 centimeters squared. Uh, so this is uh, my group uh, contribution, uh, people working uh, and in the research projects. And these are the funding agencies. And thank you for your interest. Um, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Nazir. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation about uh, Perse uh, Perov Perovskite <laughs> uh, solar cell and the modules. So now we have entered the uh, Q&A session. Uh, Ivan, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, so first of all, let me raise a question uh, from the registration. So Mr. De Chen Locke from Triple E, he asked three questions about the uh, our uh, perovskite Perov solar cells. So first of all, uh, how has the development of solar cell progressed from 2017 to recently? Yeah, the progress is enormous. In 2017, I would not have encouraged anybody to oh. go for the hydrogen. Can you hear me? Can oh. you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah. In 2017, the situation is totally different from today. Today, we are very optimistic that we can go for the production of 100 megawatt scale perovskite modules because the stability has significantly improved, particularly in three companies which I have mentioned, GCL, Microconta, um, Atmolite. All these people, they have enhanced the stability of the perovskite compositions in their module, uh, uh, big modules. So in two or three years, you can see the, uh, the perovskite modules at a utility scale level. 
it's extremely cheap technology, low cost production, and you can produce wherever you need. This is a extremely low tech technology. Okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you. And the second question is, what is holding back solar panel efficiency? Um, yes, solar panel efficiency, the perovskite when you deposit on a smaller cell, so the crystallization is a very important. And this crystallization process, you control on a smaller cell, a smaller scale by additives and uh, fenching with the different solvents. Uh, this gives you enhanced uh, crystal growth. That's the reason very highest efficiency you can get with the smaller cells. When you go for the module level, this crystallization process is different. So this is the, the scaling up factor, improving the crystal crystallinity of the films, the film formation is important. So this is the drawback. But the stability of the materials, the, 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 we came a long way. So the only the crystallization process at a large scale reproducibility is important parameter, which is maybe holding. So in a couple of years, you will see the huge market potential coming from these companies. They are testing in fields, fields already. Okay, yeah, thank you. And the third question is, is there any solution to recycling uh, perovskite uh, solar panels or any other solar panels? Yeah, this is recycling is very important for circular economy. Uh, because uh, lead iodide is a, it has its a own drawbacks, that is toxicity. So it's an important factor, the recycling. So recycling is very important. And it can be done very easily because uh, these materials are soluble. So you just flush with the water and collect the water, the perovskite containing water solution. Um, then you can uh, recover all the ingredients of the perovskite composition. Circularity is important and many groups are working on it. Okay, thank you. And now in our uh, Q&A uh, chat room, uh, there are seven questions already. So the first one is, uh, Matthias Parrot asked, yeah. can the DFT calculations also give you indications on the quantum efficiency of the materials? Yes, yes, you can simulate, uh, but at the end of the day, the film formation and defects are very important. And the DFT calculations, I don't know whether they can go into the in-depth of the bulk materials. Okay. And the next question from Brian Chen, what does the role of altering the hydrophilicity of the per perovskite have on the ionic motion of the perovskite, if any? Yeah, so hydrophilicity, it creates the, the ions like uh, methyl ammonium iodide. For example, we take one example, methyl ammonium iodide. Uh, when it takes water, you form a methyl ammonium and uh, methyl amine and the HI. So this, uh, they decompose. So in order to prevent this hydrophilicity, so we try to deposit hydrophobic interlayers between on top of the perovskite. So that's a, a the purpose of this interlayer uh, interface engineering is twofold. So one, uh, preservation of the defects. The second is protecting the perovskite by hydrophobic blanket on top of three-dimensional perovskite. Okay, and the next question is, uh, Suresh, uh, does the choice of halide for perovskite matter as the data show similar efficiency? The slides on ortho, meta, and the para positions of the halides. Um, yes, to put back. So this slide is talking about, can you just repeat the question again? Okay, uh, does the choice of halide for uh, perovskite matter as the data shows similar efficiency? Uh, yes, yeah, no, no, the, not, not this slide, but uh, the question is, uh, choice, uh, yes, I understood, I understood the question. Yes, of course, the choice of halide matters very much. So the highest efficiency you can get with pure iodide, FAPBI3. 
this has the lowest uh, the band gap and gives the highest efficiency. The highest efficiency reported so far is based on FAPBI3. The halide has a significant impact on the efficiency. Iodide is the real choice. And FA formidinamine is the cation for the highest efficiency. Lead is the two plus is the metal. FA PBI2, PBI3 is the is the is the choice of the material. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And next question is uh when preparing a perovskite, well all the methods, including solution, two steps, uh vacuum deposition, two step plus sublimitation, give the same perovskite. Uh, which method is uh, preferred? Okay, so this is uh, again subject to, for example, if you are working on a, a tandem solar cell, silicon perovskite tandem solar cells, silicon has a lot of pyramids. The solution processing uh, will not give us a uniform coating of the perovskite on the top and the valley, pyramid and the valley. It will not give us. So if, if at all, if I select the pyramidal structure of the silicon heterojunction solar cell, then maybe we have to use sublimation techniques so that you can uh, uh, uniformly coat on the valley as well as on the peak. This technique is suitable for the sublimation. However, sublimation technique is a slow process. It can be optimized, but right now, to our knowledge, this is a slow process. Solution processing for a square meters of square meters uh, can be a more suitable solution processing. That's a slot die coating method. Uh, for first, you can have a, either a one-step method or two-step method, slot die coating, solution processing, high throughput, large-scale production can be feasible. For sublimation, it has a unique uh, nature with the uh, sublimation on top of silicon vapors, which has a pyramidal structure. Okay, thank you. Mm, next question from Sui Jia Xi. You mentioned there are two methods for synthesis. Are there any differences in performance between materials synthesized using two methods? Yes, um, there are uh, one step method and two step method and sublimation method. In all these methods, the, the highest efficiency which I have reported is optimized. But in, in, in reality, there are a lot of differences in the composition of the, um, of the films. So they, you have to do a lot of um, optimization in order to get the uniform, uniformly reproducible films, thickness and uh, low defects uh, with the uh, uh, suitable um, the, and, uh, the composition. This is very important. This is, uh, it's not automatically if we just make a one, solution and then you deposit, it will not be uh, easy to get these reproducible films. There's a lot of optimization needed to be in order to get the high efficiency, high throughput and the uh, high, uh, high reproducibility. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, Avani Gupta asked, when you talked about the device structure, you use ionic liquids with chlorine ions to remove defects what defects are you talking about there? Yeah, so in the perovskite, so the perovskite is a composition which is a ionic as well as um, covalent in nature. So when you have a perovskite, uh, iodides, they are labile and the cations also is labile. So these are the, when you have a motion of these ions, you form your defects. So these defects can be passivated by having ionic liquid inside the perovskite composition. Okay. 